Chapter 8, Estimating Single Population Parameters. In this video, you'll learn about point estimates and confidence interval estimates for a single population mean. Recall in previous chapters where we learned about sample means and sample proportions. In this chapter, we also refer to them as point estimates in that we are using the sample data to estimate what's going on in the population. So here are some familiar symbols that we've seen consistently over the past several chapters. We have mu for the population mean and x bar for the sample mean. We have little p for the population proportion and p bar for the sample proportion. For example, if I wanted to estimate the class average on exam two, I can sample five students exam two grades and get a sample mean or x bar. In addition, if I wanted to study the population of Oceanside drivers, I could obtain a sample of 100 people and have found that 42 of them lease their cars. Thus, the point estimate here would be the sample proportion, or p-bar. Now, recall in Chapter 7 that we learned about sampling error, in that our statistic from a sample is subject to sampling error because it will not be the exact same value as our population parameter. So that concept is carried into this chapter as well. In this chapter, we're going to build on our point estimate by developing a confidence interval estimate. An interval is the distance between two numbers or a range. For instance, an interval for the time it takes me to go to work would be between 35 and 45 minutes. Or perhaps another interval could be the age of students in our class, which may be 18 to 30 years of age. These intervals are developed based on a particular confidence level. So here we have our definition of a confidence interval estimate. It is an interval developed from a sample such that if all possible intervals of a given width were constructed, a percentage of these intervals, known as the confidence level, would include the true population parameter. So we can see in the very middle is our point estimate from our sample. Say my average commute time from a sample of five days that I drive to work is 40 minutes. My lower confidence limit then is 35 minutes and my upper confidence limit is the 45 minutes. Note that the distance between my sample mean to each of my lower and upper limits are even. Note that in the top title here, we're going to be developing a confidence interval estimate for the population mean when we know the population standard deviation. It's important to know because the formulas you use for each situation will vary. So in this case, we're going to be learning the formula for when we know the population standard deviation. So the format of our confidence interval estimate is our point estimate plus or minus the critical value times our standard error. We've worked with these three pieces of the formula before. We're just putting them together in a particular order to create our confidence interval estimate. So our point estimate is just our sample mean. You learned how to calculate this by hand and as well as with Excel. We also learned about the standard error in chapter seven, which is where we take the standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size or little n. The critical value is the z values that you previously converted from an x value and use those to look up probabilities in Appendix D. So here, we're now linking these confidence levels, or the percentages right here, to their corresponding Z values. Here is a table with the most commonly used confidence levels and their Z values in business. You'll see this on the worksheet I provided, and you'll see it in the textbook as well. Let me explain a bit further how we get these Z values with particular confidence levels. So recall when we converted an x value into a z value and then went to the appendix D, it would give us the area from the middle out to a particular z value. So for instance, here we have a z value of 1.96, or also right here, right, 1.96. And that gives us the area right here from the middle out to 1.96 as 0.475 or 47.5%. So that is the area on the right side of our curve. And similarly, if we also use negative 1.96 as our z value, 
when I look at it this way, it's also 0.475 or 47.5% because recall that our bell shape is symmetrical. It's the same on both sides. That's why when you look at the appendix D, we don't see any negatives because the negative simply tells you that I'm on the left side of the curve, but the number in the appendix is the probability or the area of this shaded space right here. So when I add 0.475 from both sides, I get 0.95 or 95%. What our 95% confidence interval tells us then is that 95% of the intervals will fall within the shaded area. So let's see some examples. What does this mean? For instance, if I take a particular sample, let's, let's just call it sample one. My interval is a particular width. So you can see the width here. In this case, uh, it's based on 95% and our width includes this z value of 1.96. So as you can see, my interval, as it goes across here, it includes the true population mean as it touches somewhere within this interval. So it's within my range. Here's my second sample. Let's say I draw another sample and we note that my sample mean falls outside of my shaded area. It's out here in the tail. And so when I look at my interval, we can see the true population mean is not within my interval. See this green line? It's outside of it. So we know that sample two does not include the population mean. It's outside of our 95% confidence interval. In our third sample mean here, my point estimate falls in my shaded region, right? So I can see my arrow here pointing to the shaded region. And if we look, my true population mean, or the green line, does cross or is within my confidence interval estimate. Same with our fourth sample mean, where my sample mean here is still within the shaded region. And so my, if we look at my interval estimate, it does include our true population mean, or the green line here. And we can re keep repeating this over and over and over with different sample means and we'll find that 95% of them will include our true population mean, while 5% will be outside. Because if you look here in the tails, 0.025 plus 0.025 is 0.05 or 5%. So you can see, in other words, we're saying that 95% of our intervals will, will be within here and include our population mean, whereas 5% will be outside. So you can see that 95% and 5% are complements of each other because when you add them up, it equals 100% or the value of one. Let's look at an example. So the distribution of hours worked by students at Miracosta College is normally distributed. Remember, normally distributed means bell-shaped. If the population standard deviation is known to be five hours, construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval estimate for the mean hours worked by all students if a random sample of 64 students has a mean of 23 hours. Let's break this down. So here's our general format for a confidence interval estimate, and here's our formula that we're going to start plugging in the numbers from our story. So our point estimate, our x bar, our sample mean, will look here so we see our mean is 23 hours. Then we want to find our critical z value based on a 90% confidence level. You could go into Appendix D and try to work backwards to find out which Z value uh, includes 90% of our data, but it's just easier to use our table here because it's commonly used. You've got 90% is our Z value of 1.645. And then our uh, population standard deviation is given to us at five hours, and our sample size of students is uh, 64. So we have all the pieces here that we're going to end up plugging into the formula. Once I set up the variables into the formula, I want to solve for everything to the right of my plus or minus sign. So I'm going to take 1.645 multiplied by 5 divided by the square root of 64. This will give me 23 plus or minus 1.03. To get my confidence interval estimate, I will subtract, that's what this plus or minus symbol means, I'm going to first subtract 1.03 from 23, and then I'm going to add 1.03 
to 23. So this will give me my interval of 21.97 hours to 24.03 hours. So if I draw or visualize my interval, we can see here the 23 is in the middle, and my lower limit is 21.97 based on a uh, z value of 1.645. And if I add my 1.03, uh, my upper limit is 24.03 hours for my 90% confidence interval. In other words, based on the sample data, with 90% confidence, we can conclude that the true population mean is somewhere between 21.97 and 24.03 hours. Now the reason why we want to provide an estimate with an interval like this is because when we're talking to a decision maker, uh, it's better to provide an estimate where we're giving a range of our, where our true population mean might fall in between rather than giving a precise number because we know that our estimates are prone to sampling error. So we give a window or an interval uh, to estimate. Now using our same problem, I want to highlight one concept that you may have heard of before, which is our margin of error. So this right side here of the formula, the margin of error is denoted by the letter E and is essentially the right side of our formula where we take the critical value times our standard error. So in other words, uh, when I multiply and divide these out, my margin of error is essentially 1.03. You may have heard the term margin of error before, such as with election polls, where pollsters will estimate how many people will vote for a candidate, plus or minus some margin of error. So again, here we can see that for the margin of error, it's half of our interval. Our margin of error is on either side of our sample mean or our point estimate. The margin of error indicates that the sample mean of 23 hours is within 1.03 hours of the true population mean. So what happens if we modify our confidence level? As you can see here in our table, these are the commonly used confidence levels. So here, keeping my 23 hours as our sample mean, and our standard deviation and our sample size of 64 students stays the same. The only thing I'm changing is my confidence level or the Z value here in green. So using my calculator, when I work my right side of the formula out, I'm going to get a different margin of error based on my confidence level I choose to use. Notice that as my confidence level goes up, my margin of error increases because I'm making my interval wider which in turn makes my tails on either end smaller. But what if we modified our sample size? Here we are keeping our sample mean of 23 hours the same and our 90% confidence level, which is the critical Z value of 1.645, but we're changing our sample size from 64 to 100 and 144. When I use my calculator to work these pieces out, we can see now that our margin of error decreases as our sample size gets bigger. This ties back to when we learned about the central limit theorem, that the bigger the sample, the closer we get to our true population mean, and our curve gets more narrow. So a smaller margin of error is better because that means we're closer to our true population mean. Now here's the issue with that though, is we've got some conflicting confidence interval objectives. We want a small margin of error, meaning we want to be as close to the true population mean as possible. And we want a high confidence because 99% is better than 80%, which means more of our intervals are within that shaded area. And at the same time, we want a smaller sample size because in business we have limited resources such as time and money to be collecting sample data. So we don't want to use large sample sizes and waste time and money to collect a lot of information. So we have to find the right balance of these three components. Let's practice using problem three from the chapter. So here you're going to construct a 95% confidence interval estimate for the population mean given the following values. Notice there's no story here, we're just working through the formula. We have our sample mean of 300, a population standard deviation of 55, and a sample size, or n, of 250. So step one, let's make sure we identify our n. 
Next, step two, what's our confidence level that we want? In this case, 95%. Then we need to compute or find the sample mean. So on the homework, for instance, if you're given a data set, you'll need to use Excel to find the sample mean. But then in this problem, you're given it at 300. Then for step four, we have to determine our standard error of the sampling distribution. You learned how to do this in chapter seven. We already know it. In this case, you take your standard deviation of 55 and divide it by the square root of 250. That gives us a standard error of 3.48. In step five, we have to identify the critical value, which is based off of our confidence level of 95%. So I'm going to go to the table. And that 95%, our z-value is 1.96. And then we'll plug in all our pieces into the formula, right? We plug in our point estimate of 300. We plug in our Z value of 1.96 and our standard error of 3.48. So when I plug in all my numbers and I uh, work out the right half or my margin of error, we get 300 plus or minus 6.82. So we'll subtract 6.82 from 300 and add 6.82 to 300 to get our lower and upper confidence limits at 293.18 to 306.82.